Hello everyone, this is Mary here. And today, I will tell you about a film based on the story of real Texas murders, in which the law enforcement officers will conduct a dangerous hunt for a maniac, putting their own lives on the line. The film is called Midnight in the Switchgrass. Be careful, spoilers ahead. The film begins with the viewer being shown the city of Pensacola in Florida from a bird's eye view, and the voiceover philosophically argues that some animals are born predators, others are victims, and only man is given a choice. Whoever said that must not have been to Pensacola, concludes the voice. A random driver finds a gutted woman's purse and a driver's license by the river. As he looks around, a shot rings out. Holy Christ! The man is frightened, but then a much more terrible find awaits him, aside, hidden by reeds, lies the corpse of a young woman in torn clothes with marks of beatings and bites on her body. The detectives who arrived at the site of a terrible find carry out routine work, and here we first get acquainted with one of the main characters of the film, policeman Byron Crawford, who approaches his colleagues and asks a few questions. For some reason, this case interested him, Byron makes an assumption about the place of the girl's murder, incomprehensible to the rest. She was killed at a primary location and dumped here last night. But the details are not yet disclosed to the viewer. Then we see a young girl leading the party and staggering along the road until she reaches a gas station. She is clearly under the influence of drugs, which is used by one of the drivers, starting to rudely pester. However, another man hits him on the head and takes the ill-witted girl into his truck, explaining that it is not safe at the gas station. The last frame shows surveillance footage of the incident, hinting to the viewer that the police will soon be investigating the case as well. Meanwhile, FBI agent Carl Helter is monitoring a roadside motel from his car while his partner, the pretty Rebecca, poses as a girl of easy virtue in one of the rooms. But here's the bad luck. The man who came to the meeting turns out to be not the one the agents are looking for. This is a local pimp who scared off a potential client and came to explain the new rules of work in his territory. The operation is thwarted, and it would be necessary to leave, but the rudeness of the man infuriates Rebecca. She stops the attack attempt and in response, beats the impudent one. At the same time, the driver of the truck, Peter, is taking a girl picked up at a gas station to his home. He tells his fellow traveler about his little daughter, whose photos are attached to the control panel, says that she will certainly be delighted with her, and the girl is not afraid. In the morning, Byron Crawford has to endure a real battle with his boss. He angrily chastises the man for being obsessed with one thing and does not listen to objections. Byron's attempts to link seven murders into a single series, to involve the feds in the case, to do something to move forward in the investigation, the chief rejects. He removes the man from the case, but Byron cannot be intimidated by severely knitted eyebrows. He promises to look for the killer of the girls, even if the rest of them do not care. And I just can't seem to reconcile that no more. Rebecca also has a hard time. Yesterday's scandal forces the FBI to curtail the operation to capture the criminal operating on I-10 and send partners to another location. The woman sees with anger and bluntly declares to Carl that she will not budge until she meets with the suspect, who was frightened off by an unlucky pimp yesterday. Byron is investigating the murder of the girl Sarah, found by the river, at the beginning of the film. Her mother greets the cop unfriendly, but the cop's sincerity wins her over. I guess I appreciate the honesty. A woman tells a visitor about her difficult childhood with an alcoholic father, about a difficult relationship with her daughter. Sarah moved out of the house almost a year ago and didn't understand men at all, no wonder she suffered. The woman realizes that the killer is unlikely to be caught, but asks Byron to inform her if this does happen. Will you come back and knock on this door? Depressed, Byron returns home. The sight of his wife playing with the child briefly distracts him, but soon thoughts of work, murders and disappearances of people, again, pile on the policeman. The wife comforts Byron, almost verbatim repeating the man's own words, besides him, the missing girls have no one to rely on. And that's why these girls need someone like you. The driver of the truck also returned home. The girl is not with him, and the viewer can only guess where she is now. A man spends a cozy evening with his wife and daughter Bethany. They talk warmly, have dinner, and only the message that Peter needs to go again into the night makes his wife gently reproach him for being away too often. You know, we're out here in the middle of nowhere with two neighbors we barely know. Everything looks completely innocent. True, in a minute, we meet a loving husband and father in a cheap motel, where he is lured into the room by a prostitute. At first, it seems that the man does not mind relaxing, but instead of a pleasant continuation of the evening, he pounces on the girl and strangles her. In the morning, Peter's daughter plays in the field. Her ball rolls to a half-buried pipe in the thicket. Bethany is examining the find curiously when stifled sobs come from the chimney. I wonder if there's anything in here. <gasps> the frightened girl runs away, and plaintive requests for help rush to her back. Help. Is anybody there? 
cries the girl taken away from the gas station, whom Peter left, tied up in some dark room, with an outlet pipe. Byron Crawford arrives to investigate another murder. This is again a young girl found in a hotel bathroom with her head broken in six places. Carl and Rebecca also arrive there, who yesterday in vain waited in ambush for the suspect. The local detective rudely tells them to get out. FBI leadership is required by protocol to contact local police before allowing officers access to a crime scene. The suppressed agents leave. Rebecca is especially worried, confident that she could have prevented the murder if she had caught the maniac in time. The partners are followed by Byron, who shares the details of the investigation, reports the girl missing from the gas station, it turns out her name is Tracy, and leaves a business card asking him to call if fresh information appears. At home, Peter is going through an amazing metamorphosis. Here he takes out the things of the murdered women from the cache, inhales their smell and enjoys, reliving the moments of the murder again. But he gently hugs Bethany, who almost caught her father in his strange occupation, and gently talks to the girl. Peter is sure that his daughter was sent to him as a gift to fill the man's heart with love. However, as soon as Peter goes down to the secret room, where Tracy is lying on a mattress, he turns into a psychopath. The man gives the girl a bucket of water and rudely orders her to wash herself. Tracy asks to let her go and promises to behave well, but she already understands that she will not leave the maniac's lair alive. In the evening, Rebecca and Byron sit in a bar. A police officer tells a woman about seven murders that are clearly connected by common features. The victims are young women involved in prostitution, and characteristic bite marks are found on their bodies. Byron made a request to the FBI, but this did not give anything but a blurry psychological portrait of the killer, which fits every third man in Florida. Many believe that women deserve their end by the wrong way of life, so the murders are not eager to investigate. However, Byron is sure that everyone deserves justice. Rebecca, in turn, informs him that she has already contacted a possible killer for a long time. The woman flirts with the suspect via the internet, trying to lure her into a meeting, but the operation has already failed twice. It becomes clear that Peter, who strangled the prostitute in the motel, was actually going on a date with Rebecca. Byron directs the woman to Heather, the sister of the girl kidnapped by Peter. It turns out that she specifically put Tracy out of the room, wanting to protect her sister from the harassment of her pimp Calvin, and did not imagine that she was pushing her into the hands of a maniac. Calvin turns out to be the same brat that Rebecca beat up at the beginning of the movie. A tough conversation with him gives the agent a lead. That evening, the pimp saw a trucker outside the room and knows that he drives a truck with a pattern of lightning. Before Rebecca leaves, the man tries to make himself feel sorry for himself by revealing that he saw his father shoot himself as a child. The agent is relentless, she also had to endure the suicide of her mother, but these are just excuses. Psychological trauma does not give a person the right to do evil. Rebecca shares her find with Carl, who is less than enthusiastic about what he hears. He is no longer young, is divorcing his wife and does not want to be killed, working in tandem with a woman he considers toxic. Rebecca's ardent desire to cleanse the world of scum may one day lead them both into trouble. Byron is called to help the woman. The newly minted partners again get in touch with the alleged killer via the internet, make an appointment at a local bar, but during the operation they are separated, and Rebecca is taken away from the bar by Peter, who arrived in time for the meeting and managed to secretly drug the FBI agent. Byron, who has lost track of his partner, is rushing around the city in a panic. He finds footage from the cameras at the gas station, which the police could not get to, calculates the company that owns the truck with lightning, and along the way quarrels with his wife, who does not understand how her husband can leave her alone with a seriously ill child. Byron even breaks the law by going through the shipping company's files without a warrant. He is haunted by thoughts about the murdered women and their relatives, to whom he is forced to tell the terrible truth. Finally, through incredible effort and a bit of luck, the police officer determines the identity of the driver who kidnapped Tracy. Rebecca woke up in Peter's dungeon. She is chained to the wall and exhausted, but finds the strength to first make the mortally frightened Tracy respond, and then persuade her to try to escape, reminding the girl of her sister and strengthening her faith in herself. Okay, I need you to do it for Heather. Because she loves you. Tracy breaks open the grate of the air duct and crawls out through the pipe to freedom. She hides in a tall grass field and takes refuge in the house of Peter's neighbor. Following the girl on the porch, the kidnapper appears, who heard his daughter's screams about a man running across the field Daddy! Somebody's outside, right through the field! and rushed to check on the captives. He manages to get into the neighbor's house, using her dog as an excuse, but Tracy manages to hide behind the sofa. An enraged Peter returns to the dungeon, where he beats, strangles and interrogates Rebecca, while Byron is talking to the truck driver's wife, just a few tens of meters away. The policeman hears the echoes of a nearby noise. 
he heads for the sound with his gun at the ready and is almost too late to help. During the beating, Rebecca managed to pick up a screwdriver from the floor, which, at the first opportunity, she sticks deep into the chest of the kidnapper. However, this nearly costs the woman her life. Without Peter, there is no one to take her out of the loop, and Rebecca gradually loses consciousness. Looks like it's time for her to die. The woman returns to consciousness already in a hospital bed. Byron and Carl are on duty nearby. The partner explains that Rebecca will have to wait until her throat heals, after which she can speak. The rescued Tracy is taken away from the neighbor's house in an ambulance. Peter's wife and daughter, stunned by what has happened, are taken outside. Finally, we are shown the look of a girl, and we understand that another child has been mentally traumatized for life. What will it mean for Bethany? What will be the consequences? Byron comes to Sarah's mother to inform her of the capture of the killer, and gives her his daughter's cross. A woman hugs a policeman and cries. That's all. This is such a controversial ending. He evoked ambivalent feelings in me, on the one hand, the maniac was eliminated, the main characters survived, and justice prevailed. On the other hand, nine people died. Be sure to write your opinion on this film in the comments. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel to be the first to watch my new retelling and hit the bell to get notified.